Hi, I'm Valerie Goss, Stroke Program Coordinator for Baptist Health Louisville. I've been given the honor to get to speak with you today about our program here at Baptist Health Louisville. Some of the things that we'll discuss in this lecture are the types of strokes, both ischemic and hemorrhagic, the treatment options for each of these types of stroke, risk factors, both preventable and non-preventable, and then just some general facts about stroke. Participating in Get With The Guidelines Stroke Hospitals is the first level of recognition. It acknowledges program participation and entry of baseline data into the patient management tool. Achievement Awards. The awards recognize hospitals that demonstrate at least 85% compliance in each of the seven Get With The Guidelines stroke achievement measures. The different levels reflect the amount of time from which the hospital demonstrates performance. The Bronze Award recognizes performance of 90 consecutive days. The Silver recognizes performance of 12 consecutive months. And the Gold Award recognizes performance of 24 consecutive months or more. In 2012, we received the Target Stroke Honor Roll. In order to receive this award, at least 50% of our patients had to receive TPA in less than 60 minutes. And you'll see in 2015, we received the Target Stroke Elite Plus Award, where 75% patients were, had to receive TPA in less than 60 minutes, and 50% of patients received TPA in less than 45 minutes. Baptist Health Louisville is an advanced primary stroke center. We are certified by the Joint Commission, which was founded in 1951 with the mission of improving health care. The Joint Commission is the first organization to establish a program for primary stroke center certification in 2003 through its disease-specific care division. The certification is valid for two years. As you can see from the slide, our organization has been Joint Commission certified as a primary stroke center since 2007 and has been recertified every year since. Our next survey is due in the spring of 2017. Baptist Health Louisville is an advanced primary stroke center. We are certified by the Joint Commission. The Joint Commission was founded in 1951 with the mission of improving health care. The first, Joint Commission was the first organization to establish a program for primary stroke center certification in 2003 through its disease-specific care division. The certification is valid for two years. As you can see, Baptist first, was first certified in 2007, and we have been successfully certified since both in 2009, 11, 13, and 15, with our next survey being in spring of 2017. We offer comprehensive stroke care and services, including 24-7 neurointerventional coverage by the most senior and experienced group of physicians in the metro area, if not the entirety of the Commonwealth. We have 24-7 advanced modality neuroimaging capabilities with fellowship-trained neuroradiologists who take call in-house. In addition, we have 24-7 neurosurgical coverage, as well as vascular surgery and cardiovascular services. As you probably already know, Baptist Health Louisville is a magnet hospital and is recognized for the quality of care in multiple specialties. What is stroke? A stroke occurs when a vessel in the brain is blocked by a clot or when the vessel rupture. This causes the brain to be deprived of oxygen, resulting in lack of oxygen Without oxygen, the brain cells die within minutes. The brain is a remarkable... What is stroke? A stroke occurs when a vessel in the brain is blocked by a clot, as seen in the ischemic stroke, or when the vessel ruptures, as seen in the hemorrhagic stroke. This causes the brain to be deprived of blood, resulting in lack of oxygen. Without oxygen, brain cells die within minutes. The brain is a remarkably complex organ with a vast array of structures and functions. Therefore, a stroke for one person does not necessarily present exactly like the stroke for another person. It is important for nurses to understand the unique differences between, between the types of stroke so that they can understand the differences in the care and recovery. We've all heard the saying, time is brain. I think this graphic does a good job of quantifying what exactly that means. I only highlighted the section uh, for the one minute 
Um, because every minute that you're not making a move or every minute that you're not identifying those signs and symptoms um, that a patient has for stroke, the patient's losing 1.9 million neurons and 14 billion synapses, which can accelerate their age just in that one minute by 3.1 weeks. So I think it's important, this um, slide is important just to let you know how important it is to act fast for these patients. You probably have heard the term golden hour. Um, golden hour is used to designate the hour immediately following the onset of stroke symptoms. The reason they call this hour golden is that in stroke patients have a much greater chance of surviving and avoiding long-term brain damage if they arrive at the hospital and receive treatment within that first hour. So again, that's why it's so important to act fast with these patients. As I mentioned earlier, there are two different types of stroke, both ischemic and hemorrhagic. Ischemic being the most common, with about 87% of strokes being ischemic, where the blood vessel in the brain becomes narrowed or clogged, causing decreased blood flow to the brain. And then hemorrhagic, which rep represents about 13% of stroke patients, where there's a rupture of blood vessel in or near the brain. This section we'll talk a little bit more about the ischemic stroke. As I already mentioned earlier, um, the ischemic stroke is the most common type of stroke. There are three different subtypes um, of ischemic strokes that we'll discuss in detail. And then we'll talk about TIA a little bit. TIA, um, most of you probably um, have heard of before. Um, oftentimes, the older population calls it uh, a pen stroke or a mini stroke. Um, but these are actually, um, TIAs are actually fo focal neurological deficits similar to stroke symptoms, um, but they have complete re resolution of the deficit um, and also no radiological findings. So both the CT and the MRI are both negative, um, and then these patients typically rapidly uh, improve. Um, therefore, we don't call it a stroke because they've improved or uh, returned back to baseline. Historically, a TIA was defined um, by a time-based parameter. So for those symptoms that resolve themselves within 24 hours, we just um, termed it as a uh, TIA. Um, TIA is a warning sign. So it's a precursor that a stroke, that you have a potential for having a stroke. Um, there's lots of data out there that talks about what the actual percentage or ch uh, chance of a patient having a stroke after having a TIA. The, um, the period that they are at most danger, which is in the first 72 hours, but definitely up to one year, the patient um, has an increased risk of having, um, as some people would say, a full-blown stroke um, if they've had a previous TIA or even a previous stroke in the past. Um, ischemic strokes, the symptoms of, with these patients can develop over a few minutes and then worsen over time. Um, some people start having these symptoms and they lay down and take a nap and then wake up um, to find that the symptoms have worsened. You know, knowing what those warning signs are, so that sudden severe headache with no known cause, that unexplained dizziness, unsteadiness, or sudden falls, especially um, with any other signs, um, that sudden dimness or loss of vision, particularly in one eye. So just remembering um, to remind your patients that most of the time these symptoms usually are on a single side of the body. And then sudden difficulty speaking or trouble understanding speech. Um, and then the uh, fifth one would be that sudden weakness or numbness of the face, arm, le or leg. Again, typically on just a single side of the body. And most of these symptoms, or all of these symptoms usually, um, are on the same side of the body. So just making sure that your patients know um, what those signs and symptoms of stroke are. So the three different types of stroke, thrombotic. So in a thrombotic stroke, the blood flow of the brain is blocked by a clot in an artery, usually caused, again, by uh, atherosclerosis. So plaque builds up inside that, those arteries, causing a blood clot, uh, which blocks the blood flow to the brain, uh, which would lead to a thrombotic um, type of ischemic stroke. The second type of stroke that we'll talk about is the embolic, where blood flow to the brain is blocked by a clot that is formed elsewhere and travels to a brain. So a blood clot or other material may break free from another area of the body and travel to the brain. So, you know, uh, if there's a clot in the heart or a clot in the lower extremity, um, then obviously your chances are increased. The blood flow is then blocked uh, from these patients resulting in an embolic stroke. We often see this uh, in patients with atrial fibrillization where the blood clot develops in the atria and then is ejected traveling to the brain. Um, so that is a pretty significant cause 
of ischemic stroke is a lot of times those patients with new onset AFib or even those chronic AFib patients uh, present with an embolic stroke. Um, the third type, the systemic hypoperfusion, where blood flow um, low blood flow because of circulatory failure. So in a patient with a heart attack, um, having been an ER nurse, you, I have seen a few patients that actually come in with both at the same time that their heart attack is ca causing them to have stroke-like symptoms due to low blood flow um, resulting in that circulatory um, failure. I do want to clarify that a TIA um, we treat them just like a stroke, and so I don't want you to discount if the symptoms resolve or improve um, that we don't treat that like a stroke. So in our organization, a TIA, we treat it just like an acute ischemic stroke, and treatment is the same, um, imaging is the same, um, pharmacological treatment is exactly the same. So we treat it like a stroke until we know that it's not a stroke and obviously work with the patient and family for uh, modifying any of those risk factors um, to pre prevent them from moving on to that, as I mentioned, full-blown stroke. I referenced the golden hour earlier. The golden hour is always important, but it's especially important in treating the ischemic stroke. Um, the theme for today seems to have been, uh, seems to be time lost is brain loss. So again, just moving quickly and moving fast, but it's super important in the patient um, that is a potential candidate for receiving uh, TPA, which is the clot busting drug um, that is FDA approved for the acute ischemic stroke. Um, we can give it up to four and a half hours. Um, it's FDA approved up to three hours. Patients that receive TPA in that three to four and a half hour window have less success with the drug. Um, their outcomes are not as good. So obviously trying to get them here as quickly as possible and getting the drug on board as quick as possible is super important. I use the analogy um, with patients when I round. I talk to them about TPA if they haven't received it or if they didn't have a deficit that was significant enough to receive it, making sure that they know what the time window is and that they need to get here quickly. We talk about Drano, and so um, the drug rep calls this Drano for the Braino, and so I ask patients if they know what Drano does for their clog at home, and so obviously they tell me that it breaks it up and moves it on through, and that's exactly what um, TPA does for these patients as well. Now, TPA doesn't work for everyone. Um, but that is the um, primary or gold standard of care for the ischemic stroke if they have no contraindications um, to receiving TPA. If a patient receives TPA and then they're not improving, our physicians can do imaging to see if the patient is a candidate for endovascular therapies. Additionally, if the patient is outside that four and a half hour window um, and the patient is a candidate for endovascular therapy, so we can take them in and go in and retrieve the clot or suck the clot out, as some of the doctors will say. Other treatment um, options that we have here, obviously, are just supportive measures. So PT, OT, rehab, speech, um, making sure that patients um, have modified their risk factors before they leave. So we talk to them uh, about those, whether it be pharmacological or diet management. Uh, or diabetes management, whatever it may be, um, but those are some of the other things that we do here at Baptist Health uh, prior to sending a patient home with an ischemic stroke. Hemorrhagic stroke is the next type of stroke that we'll talk about. Um, it results from a weakened vessel that ruptures and bleeds. Um, as you can see from the slide and, and mentioned earlier, it accounts for about 13% of all types of stroke. Uh, and that's a good thing um, because these patients typically have a poor prognosis and higher mortality. Um, so if you're going to have a stroke, the ischemic stroke is the type to have, not that you have a preference, obviously. Um, but these patients, um, their prognosis, is, as I said, is, is pretty poor. Most of these patients discharge to long-term care facility, if not palliative, and, and majority of them don't make it out of the facility um, to move on to the, to the next level. Um, the symptoms for these patients typically appear suddenly. Um, they're often associated with severe headache, nausea, and vomiting. Um, the most common cause for hemorrhagic stroke um, or is high blood pressure. Um, that constant force of high blood pressure on the vessel walls can weaken them, resulting in bleeding in the brain or hemorrhage. Um, other causes um, that have been noted are the ABM malformation. The thin-walled vessels present at birth that over time burst or leak into the brain. Uh, trauma, blood thinners, and aneurysm leak or rupture are some additional um, causes for hemorrhagic stroke. Hemorrhagic stroke has two subsets, um, the subarachnoid hemorrhage, which is the SAH, and the intracranial hemorrhage, which is the ICH. Um, the SAH are often seen for, from aneurysms, and the ICH most commonly 
um, seen in those patients with high blood pressure. In the SAH, it's a bleeding artery on or near the surface of the brain um, that bursts and spills into the space between the brain and the skull, which is the subarachnoid space. Um, and as I mentioned, it's often caused by the bursting aneurysm. Um, as mentioned before, the symptoms are sudden and typically severe headache is most commonly seen with the subarachnoid hemorrhage. The intracranial hemorrhage is a bleeding vessel in the brain that bursts, spilling into the surrounding tissue. Um, again, most common cause is the high blood pressure. Um, time is still of the essence with these patients as well, although there's not um, some great um, drug to break up the clot or to uh, seal the bleed, it is still super important to get these pa patients here as quickly as possible um, so we can provide services for them. So as far as services and treatment options that we have for the hemorrhagic patient, um, the primary goal is to control blood pressure for these patients um, through medications. So obviously we want to decrease the pressure to help decrease um, the bleeding to that hemorrhagic site. Um, surgery is possible for these patients. Obviously location and the cause of the hemorrhage um, is key. Um, we also offer some of the same supportive measures, so PT, OT, speech, rehab, um, palliative services, um, and obviously chaplain services for family support uh, for this patient population. Stroke risk factors, there are two types of risk factors, those that you can control and do something about and those that you cannot. So we'll start with the ones that you cannot control. Um, age, gender, race, family history, a PFO, which is a heart defect and others may call it a hole in the heart, and then a previous stroke or TIA. Um, we'll start with age, so obviously the older that we get, the, we have increased chances for many things, um, but the vessel walls get thinner, so the chance of having stroke is um, significantly increased the older we get. Gender, females um, have a slightly higher um, incidence of stroke uh, over males at 51% versus 49%. And then race, African Americans have a um, significantly higher uh, prevalence of stroke than any other ethnicity. Family history, so um, mother, father, grandparents, uh, sibling that has had a history of a stroke. Um, nothing we can do about that. We can't uh, get rid of genetics. PFO, um, that again, as I mentioned, that hole in the heart um, could, or a fibromuscular dysplasia could increase your risk for stroke. And again, not anything that you can do about that. You're born with that. And then previous stroke or TIA, um, which if um, we're having a conversation with patients, if I'm having a conversation with patients and they've had a previous stroke or TIA, um, and again, not anything that you can do about it, but just letting them know that their risk factor or their risk for having a stroke is significantly higher. The things that we can control, obviously physical inactivity, um, obesity, alcohol use, tobacco use, patient has hypertension, diabetes, high cholesterol, atrial fibrillation, and atherosclerosis. Um, so physical inactivity and obesity typically go hand in hand. hand. Um, sed patients with sedentary lifestyles tend to be uh, overweight and so just talking with patients about um, what we can do to, um, in to decrease their BMI, making sure patients know what their BMI is, what an ideal BMI is, so that body mass index. Um, alcohol use, so obviously discouraging that and then providing resources to help them um, with um, treatment of um, eliminating alcohol from their um, daily routine. The same for tobacco use, the smoking cessation um, programs um, that are out there and just helping them through that, some through pharmacological uh, methods and modalities, um, but just figuring out what works best for the patient. Um, oftentimes we have patients that are, uh, know that they're hypertension, or hypertensive, pardon me, um, but are not taking the medications or can't afford the medications uh, to decrease their blood pressure. The same goes for the other diagnoses below, the diabetes, high cholesterol, atrial fibrillation, or atherosclerosis. Um, they're aware of this, or oftentimes we find those uh, with the initial presentation. They haven't seen a doctor in uh, several years, and we're not aware that they had any of these uh, diagnoses. And those are things that we uh, can't control. We can just modify uh, through either medication or, as I said, um, through programs and support. So just a little bit of further clarification for the trans ischemic attack or the mini stroke or pin stroke that I mentioned earlier. Uh, oftentimes, approximately um, one third of patients who have a TI 
a have actually had a stroke um, which usually is a lacunar stroke so frequently uh, even uh, primary care physicians and various providers call it a mini stroke or a pin stroke when the patient truly has had um, an actual um, injury to the brain um, again, I told you earlier that this is a tempor temporary decrease in um, blood supply to the brain. Oftentimes, it resolves within minutes to hours. Um, the term uh, TIA was defined in the past as any symptoms that resolved within 24 hours. I think I mentioned to you earlier that here at Baptist Health Level, we treat all TIAs as an acute ischemic stroke until we otherwise know otherwise. Um, obviously, if these patients have had a TIA, the risk for having a um, stroke in the future is significantly increased, and so we try to modify the risk factors prior to them being discharged from our facility. So a little bit of overlap here. So the stroke signs and symptoms. So to kind of reiterate those, I use the word sudden, and I use it often with patients. I just remind them um, to remember when they're wondering if this is a possible sign or symptom of a stroke, that they asked herself, was this sudden? So that sudden weakness or numbness on one side of the body, face, arm, or leg, that sudden confusion, trouble speaking or trouble understanding, that sudden trouble with vision in one or both eyes, that sudden trouble walking, so they are dizzy, they've lost their balance or coordination, and then that sudden severe headache. Um, it may be accompanied by nausea and vomiting. Um, headache is one of the symptoms that's so subtle um, that people often uh, discount it. So just remember, if they have a headache plus something else, you should probably be thinking stroke. Uh, most often, the symptoms that accompany that are nausea and vomiting. So we're back to our common theme, time is brain. So every minute counts, and we tell patients to act fast. So reminding your patients or teaching your patients and their families what the acronym FAST means is very important. So face, arm, speech, and time. So the F in FAST stands for face. Does one side of the face droop? So you ask the patient to smile. So just making sure that they know what the F in FAST stands for. Next is A, which is arm. Is one arm weak or numb. So have the patient hold their arms out from them, ask the person to raise both arms, and does one arm drift downward? Most often times, if the patient is having a stroke, one arm will drift downwards. The S in FAST stands for speech. Is the speech slurred? Ask the person to repeat a simple sentence. Is the sentence repeated correctly? Often times, this is just a bunch of word garble where the patient knows what they're trying to say, they just can't get it out. If the patient has any one of these three symptoms, they say the chances of having a stroke is approximately 72%, I'm sorry, the probability of a stroke is about 72%. And so if you have any one of the three, then the T stands for time, and it's time to call 911 and get someone there. So the theme for today's lecture has been time is brain. Stroke is an emergency. Every minute counts, so act fast. I teach all my patients and their family members the acronym FAST. The acronym FAST stands for face, arm, speech, and time. The F stands for face. Does one side of the face droop? The way to assess this is ask the patient to smile. Looking for uneven smile at this time. Next, the A stands for arm. Is one arm weak or numb? Ask the person to raise both arms. Does one arm drift downward while assessing the patient? Next is S, which stands for speech. Is the speech slurred? Ask the person to repeat a simple sentence. Is the sentence repeated correctly? Oftentimes, it's obvious that the patient knows what they're trying to say. They just can't get it out. If you have any one of these three signs, the probability of stroke is about 71%. So at that time, if you have any one of the three, it's time to call 911 and get the patient to the hospital. Earlier we reviewed the warning signs of stroke, that sudden severe headache, that sudden unexplained dizziness or unsteadiness, that sudden dimness or loss of vision in one eye and sometimes both, that sudden difficulty speaking or trouble understanding speech, and sudden weakness and or numbness in the face, arm, or leg, generally on one side of the body. While identifying the warning signs of stroke, it is also key to know the time of onset of symptoms, when the patient was last known well. 
as this is very important in the diagnosis and treatment of the ischemic stroke patient. As I mentioned earlier, many of the treatment options are time sensitive. Brain imaging is the first line of diagnostics once the patient arrives in the emergency department in order to clarify the cause of neurological symptoms. MRI and CT imaging may be utilized in the acute phase. MRI is more detailed imaging of the brain and can de detect an ischemic stroke sooner. With CT scans, ischemic strokes may not show up for up to 48 hours. The primary purpose of a CT scan to, is to rule out a bleed to determine if a patient is a candidate for the clot-busting drug TPA or Activase. An EKG and blood tests are done soon after the imaging to provide other critical information to facilitate rapid treatment decisions. An echocardiogram is done during the first 24 to 48 hours of hospitalization and depending on the patient's presentation, other diagnostics such as lumbar puncture, transcranial Doppler, chest x-ray, EEG, and hypercoagulable lab test may be performed. Hopefully this lecture has been beneficial. I'd like to leave you with a few stroke facts. Someone in the U.S. has a stroke about once every 40 seconds. Stroke is the number five cause of death, killing more than 129,000 people a year. Stroke is the number three cause of death in women and the number five cause of death for men. Stroke is the number one preventable cause of disability. About 795,000 people have a stroke every year and an estimated 6.8 million Americans 20 and older have had a stroke. And the most profound to me is 80% of strokes can be prevented. Thank you for allowing me to talk with you today. We take great pride in the quality of care we offer here at Baptist Health Louisville and we're dedicated to offering world-class comprehensive stroke care for all patients. Thank you and have a good day.